It's not often I say this, but I'm pleased that the Parliament is producing this report and thinking seriously about the legal foundations of EU defence. Since the Brexit referendum, there has been a great rush for more Europe, and I hope this will bring some grounding back to that process. I do, of course, have concerns that I'd like to raise, in particular the Union's application of its own laws, in particular with regard to Article 42.2 on the financing of policies with defence and military implications. Operating expenditure to which the implementation of this chapter gives rise should also be charged to the Union budget, except for such expenditure arising from operations having military or defence implications and cases where the Council acting unanimously decides otherwise. Well, that speaks for itself. The treaty as it stands states that all policies can't be financed from the EU central budget. There are calls within the Parliament for policies breaching this. I would also question the current Commission proposal for the extension of the Peace and Stability Fund to the funding of third-party military actors' uh, comp combat compatibility with Article 42.4. First the issue of commonality, I, I don't often agree with Frau Losing, and she, she, she's raised that point. Um, and I really want to contradict what Mr. Pascu said. Mr. Pascu said um, some nations are worried about being left behind on collective defence. Well, the elephant in the room is something I raise often in this Parliament, and the elephant in the room which nobody's raised today, and if I can look at 15 on this report, it says, if I quote, ensure that all member states can participate in a balanced, coherent and synchronised improvement of their military capabilities. Well, again, you're all ignoring that elephant in the room, and that elephant in the room is the traditional neutrality of the Republic of Ireland, Austria and Sweden. And this is a problem you have coming in the future. You have to, you have to accept that is the way it's going. However, if a political will continues to drive towards further centralisation of defence capabilities at EU level, your closest partners, namely the United States, Canada and the United Kingdom, have to have a clear understanding of the legal foundation and possibilities of EU defence. I therefore urge you to think more carefully as you all progress with these policies. I'm also concerned by Article 14. The European Union talks a lot about cooperation with NATO and complementary capabilities. Again, it's unfortunately a policy my own government seems to be talking even after Brexit. I see it as undermining NATO. The 2 per cent spending, defence spending, is a commitment to NATO and transatlantic security throughout that alliance. Most European members don't even meet these commitments, and of course it's only through, I must say, through accounting trickery that my own country manages to do so. The 2 per cent should remain available to NATO directly from its members, and again, whilst I don't, don't approve of European Union strategic cooperative programmes, they should be financed by money above, beyond and separate to that 2 per cent NATO minimum. Thank you. Thank you.